tú eliges escuela descansa carretera y monta tranquilita niña y no pierdas la calma Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to our stage CHCI's president and CEO, Esther Aguilera. Hey, welcome back. Do I have everyone's attention? Shh. So you're going to want to get ready with some great questions for our next panel, because this is about the future. And to moderate our panel, if we have a distinguished gentleman from California representing a district in Southern California. He's also the chair of the Democratic Caucus. Please welcome the Honorable Javier Becerra. Esther, thank you very much. Is everyone enjoying the food? Is everyone enjoying the food? Okay, so I got you with me, got you with me. Uh, can I just ask real quickly, because technology is California, California is technology. Is California in the house? Yeah. Right. I know the rest of you are in the house, but I'm from California, so I had to make sure my homeboys and homegirls are here. Uh, may I just say, actually, let me, let me put it this way, because we have less than an hour, and I want to get to the panelists. For those who are my age and beyond, remember we always used to aspire to have a Color TV? Okay, now, that, now that for those who are a little younger, remember we used to aspire to get that first VCR? And then it was, when you made it, you knew you could buy one of those big suitcase-like telephones you could put in your car. Remember that? That wasn't too long ago. Well, today it's, you know, everybody's trying to get one of these, right? And pretty much everyone does, including our kids. Something magical has occurred at the same time that Latinos in America, like many other Americans, are still struggling to make it. We're still that aspiring class. We still want to make it into the middle class and beyond. But something's different. Latinos were uh, the segment in the population in this country that was fastest to incorporate the use of the personal device. Why? Because we always had to aspire to get that color TV the VCR, the, those were appliances, electronics that we couldn't afford, our parents couldn't afford. 
And so we didn't need to get on a, uh, the uh, cable stations to be able to do some of these things. We didn't need to have a cable system or some other prog uh, programming. We could get on these and access the internet. And our parents could help us, or we could help our parents access the internet. And so in a way, because the technology was so new and because we hadn't been embedded in the older technologies, we quickly captured this technology. And so that is great for us because that means we're not lagging as we typically would because our incomes don't allow us to stay with the Joneses. But are the companies that are there to provide us with this technology, including us? And are we ready for the opportunity when the door opens? That's the subject of today's lunch, and we have a phenomenal panel to talk to us about that. So let's not wait any longer. Let me begin by introducing those panelists who are here today, and we want to, as they come in, please welcome them for taking the time to be with us today and speak with us. Let me begin by introducing Yolanda Mangolini, who is the Director of Global Diversity and Talent and Inclusion and Talent and Outreach Programs at Google. Let me then have, introduce to you Ed Avila. Ed Avila is the CEO of Manos Accelerator, who over the past 20 years has worked as a human resources executive in Silicon Valley. And in 2010, he co-founded a startup called My Job Links. Ben Jealous, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and many of us remember him in his role as the former president and CEO of the NAACP. And he currently works as a partner at Kapoor Capital, an Oakland-based firm that leverages the technology sector to create progressive social change. Andrea Pimentel, business development executive at Uber. We've all heard of Uber. <laughs> and she leads partnerships and new user acquisition initiatives in the San Francisco area and nationally. She became a founding member of the business team in January 2014 and focuses on global partnerships and marketing activations. And finally, but not least, Felix Ortiz, El Tercero, the founder and chairman and chief executive officer of Viridis Learning, an education technology company that combines workforce education and human capital solutions for the middle skill workforce. Uh, in 2008, Felix served on the National Finance Committee Council for then president candidate, presidential candidate Barack Obama and on the advisory group for international trade and economics on the Obama-Biden transition team. So we're going to give each of our panelists three minutes to make some opening remarks. And I reminded them before we came on stage that I'm going to keep them to two minutes and 58 seconds. And uh, we will then go to some questions and open it up to the audience. So let me begin with Yolanda and ask her to please give us her remarks. Thank you very much. Please, let's welcome Yolanda. <laughs> Thank you very much. As the Congress has mentioned, we're in a, a, a really a, a new world order. Um, technology is so integral to, uh, to growing one's businesses, and Google is tackling this in a couple different ways. So one, we're trying to help small and medium-owned businesses grow, how to, how to understand how to grow their businesses online by giving them access to tools, um, educating them about search engine marketing, um, connecting them with mentors at Google so they understand how to use technology to create more economic impact. The other way that we're really trying to introduce technology into the business world is through investing in incubators and accelerators like Ed Avalas Manos's, which helps to coach um, young entrepreneurs right through to launch. Um, we've invested in not only in, in, in Ed, been a founding partner in, in, in Manos Accelerator, but also another accelerator um, called New Me, uh, New, Me, New Me Ventures, and have so far founded 14 startups, funded 14 startups, created 81 jobs. It's really important to us to help people understand how to use technology effectively and efficiently um, to really create economic impact for, um, for our diverse communities. It's been a priority for Google for several years, and we're super excited about the work that we have to do now. And I'll end early. Hey, wow, that's very good. <laughs> First, I want to make sure as we uh, give a round of applause to Ed that we recognize he's got some cool socks on as well. Ed Avila. So, uh. <laughs> Thank you. Well, first of all, I do want to thank uh, CHCI because it's not too often that I wear a suit. Um, coming from Silicon Valley, where you have flip-flops, jeans, and hoodies, uh, I'm surprised my suit still fits me, but uh, it's good to be here. Um, that explains the socks. Then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with Manos, Manos Accelerator, um, born and raised in San Jose, and, and there's really two words that I would describe as far as where we are today, 
Latinos and tech, it's a good place to be. Um, before I approached Google um, and shared with what I wanted to do with, with Manos, which is the first of its kind accelerated its target for Latino-led early stage startups, whether it's in healthcare, enterprise, uh, education, entertainment, or media. A lot of people felt that, why do this? Why put together a program like this? Because the numbers doesn't support what, what I'm trying to do. The numbers doesn't support com computer science um, grads in a Latino community. And this wasn't one of those things where you built it and they will come. So my hunch said that there are Latinos in the creation process. We're just not users in just high tech. We're not just users in, in, in smartphones, that we actually have coders, programmers, and people creating this. So that was really my hunch. And uh, we actually went out last year um, with, with, with a call out to see, okay, we're gonna establish ourselves in downtown San Jose, uh, which was at one time the capital of Silicon Valley. And we're just gonna see how many people are interested in applying to this program. They didn't know if we were gonna get three or four or five. We actually got 75 across the US. Um, it wasn't just homegrown in Silicon Valley. We got people from Texas, from New York, from, from Florida, from Colorado. And it was just a matter of just selecting the coolest technology and the team. And so we thought, okay, first time out, we actually did our se second one. We just finished it. We had a demo day, we had six more. We could have had another three more coming from Central South America, but because of visa issues, we, we, we couldn't grow. But we're not only identifying these early stage startups, we're actually building a network of mentors coming from great companies, from Google, from LinkedIn, Facebook, Cisco, that are really getting behind this, really supporting these early stage startups. So I am encouraged, I am surprised, but I think it, this is just the beginning. And, and I, I'm really excited to see what the next two or three years out, because like Numi, we're hoping that these companies get funded, continue to work on great technologies. And we look back and say in 2013, we, we, we see a Latino founder or a team that actually do something unique. Thank you, Ed. Let me uh, ask Ben Jealous to give us some remarks and please let's welcome Ben. Thank you, thank you. Well, it's good to be here. I gotta say, I've gotten used to not wearing a tie, so I decided <laughs> I'm just not gonna do it anymore. The, um, you know, we at Kport Capital focus on doing two things at once. One is making a very strong return and the other is empowering companies that solve tough social problems. So we're excited to invest in companies like Pigeonly, founded by a young man who had come back from prison upset about how hard it was to call home, how expensive it was. You know, at a jail in Texas, it can cost $3 per minute to call home. And he applied Google Voice type technology to the problem and has thoroughly disrupted the prison phone call market or racket <laughs> and dropped the cost by more than uh, 90%. Federal prisons and now state prisons and heading towards that jail in Texas. We support companies like Plaza Familia, whose founder uh, was out there selling products to help Title I bilingual students learn faster that she knew weren't really helping them learn faster. And so she decided to create a product that she would be excited to sell. And it has taken off tremendously. Companies like Sound Focus started by a man who had dealt with hearing loss his entire life and knew that there were millions of people out there who simply could not afford the three to five thousand dollars with no insurance coverage that hearing aids cost. So we've set out, we've given ourselves a challenge to prove that you can be a top quartile venture capital firm based in the Silicon Valley and focus on investing in social impact companies. But that's not enough for us. We invest our proceeds in really in two things. One is in the Cape War Center for Social Impact that really focuses on building the pipeline into companies like Google, like Uber, but most importantly to us, into the startup economy. We support accelerators, we support programs that teach kids how to code, and we even went so far as to build a nonprofit, the uh, Level Playing Field Institute, whose summer math and science honors program 
uh, brings typically about 50% of the kids are Latino, about 40% are black, the others are kind of a range of ethnic groups. To, to the campuses of Stanford and UC Berkeley, USC, UC Los Angeles each year, for five weeks of intensive training in coding, in mathematics, uh, and in social justice. We do this for cohorts of young people three summers in a row. And instead of ending up at Cal State East Bay or Cal State Long Beach, they go to MIT, to UC Berkeley, to Caltech. And that's how we build the pipeline from the very beginning to the very end. Thank you, Ben. Please welcome Andrea Pimentel. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you, CHCI, for having me on the panel today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just so I can get a read of the audience, how many people have used Uber or know about Uber? Oh, love it. Okay, cool. So for those of you who are not familiar with Uber, that's totally okay. Um, I'll give you a brief overview. So Uber is a technology company that creates an app that connects riders with drivers. So for riders, it's really easy to get a ride wherever you need to go. All you have to do is download the app, open an account, press a button, and you can receive, a, you have a car come to you um, curbside and take you wherever you need to go. And on the driver's side, it's just as easy to pick someone up, take them wherever they need to go. Um, they get out of the car, and it's, it's, it's pretty simple. So today, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about technology and entrepreneurship, which are two really, really important topics that are integral to Uber's success. So, on the rider side, as I mentioned, it's super easy to use, but I do want to emphasize that, that Uber is allowing all riders in all parts of a city to receive a safe, affordable, and reliable ride wherever they, wherever they need to go. Um, we, we published a, a, an announcement on our blog a couple weeks ago that talks about cities like New York and Boston and Chicago where taxis would not go into specific parts of cities and now Thanks to, to, thanks to Uber and our ETA-based dispatch, um, anyone who needs a ride is able to get one. And on the driver side, Uber is empowering individuals to become entrepreneurs and small business owners on the Uber platform. And we've seen a lot of people come in, uh, drive one car, save enough money to, to buy multiple vehicles, and then end up managing a fleet and really becoming a, a small business owner. So I really believe that at Uber, if if we do our job, and if we do our job well, um, the opportunities and the economic impact that Uber is having in the U.S. can really be spread out to other Hispanic communities out, out in the world. So just, just to give you an update today, we're in 200 cities. We're in over 200 cities, 213 to be exact, and 45 countries around the world. And we cover about 55% of the, of the U.S. population. Um, and, and going back to what I was saying about uh, Uber really spreading the, the economic impact to other parts of, of the world, not just the U.S., um, let me tell you a little bit about my experience as one of the founding um, members of the, business, of the business team, but also I, I also participated on the launch team. And what that means is that you go to, to Uber markets and you open, and you open up um, cities there. So, I was in Mexico City two summers ago and was telling people about Uber, signing up people both for the demand side and, and the supply side. And this past winter, I was, ba I was back in, in Mexico City for my cousin's wedding, and I actually ended up taking a ride with a driver who um, I had onboarded two summers ago. And it was really great to, to see and hear how he had used the Uber platform to create opportunity for himself and for his family. So with that, I will close. I know you're <laughs> So that I will close by saying that technology is an incredible equalizer, and technology is a really, really powerful tool. Um, and I'm really excited to continue talking about this today. Thank you. Felix Ortiz, Ortiz the third. Well, or is your my uh, socks are. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I, I come at this from a different perspective. Uh, you know, I founded a company on my couch, literally, and I taught myself how to code. And uh, as a Latino tech entrepreneur, uh, I actually never classified myself as Latino because I felt like that would limit me to some degree in raising venture capital or financing. Uh, you know, we've been very lucky to raise a good amount of financing, but through that process, I view that technology could be an enabler for wealth creation. And you know, it's important to push and recommend that our community focus on creating you know, the next Zuckerberg or whatever it may be because that's gonna empower us as we become the majority 
of the United States to have bigger input and uh, power in certain aspects. And you know, so when I look at you know the success that my fellow Latino tech entrepreneurs have had, have had there have been successes. You know, the founder, co-founder of Clout, Joe Fernandez, they sold for two hundred million dollars. Uh, you know, the other uh, co-founder, of Facebook, was Brazilian. You know, he has a couple of billion dollars. Uh, and then you know, there are other Latinos that are fairly successful. Unfortunately, they're not connected to our community because the financing that they've received doesn't you know, come you know, fr from, from our community. So you know, what, what we strive for, or what I, one of my passions is how do we create more young Latino tech entrepreneurs besides the company that I founded, which is doing some remarkable stuff in education and workforce. But in addition to that, you know, how can we mentor these individuals and provide the enablement of what, whether Ed is doing at Manos or other aspects of access to angel investors and teach them not just how to code or that STEM is important, but teach them how to build a business that you can do well by doing good and make a lot of money and empower and become the philanthropist in your company. Uh, so that's the way that I view technology from a diversity standpoint. We're one of the most diversified tech companies. We're basically a you know, team of 14, 10 of our engineers, all are Latino or African American. Uh, we have two female uh, uh, VPs, one's Korean, another one's uh, Turkish. Uh, and then we have a, a former Navy SEAL, so we cover the gamut. Uh, so, so you know, that's very important because you don't see that. You don't, even in buddies that have founded you know, uh, tech companies that are Latino or whatever it may be, very few of them have a staff that resembles them or resembles their audience that they're trying to impact. And that's a very critical uh, uh, factor because when you create a technology, the user experience the user operability needs to align to that demographic and those individuals. And that's why, you know, if you look at certain technologies that are focused on education, they're only hitting 20% of the population that are, you know, they're, they're, you know, within the middle skill, whatever it may be, and 80% of them are, you know, highly educated because they have no sense of that usability or understanding of that demographic. And so uh, as we grow as a community, I believe that there is greater uh, opportunity uh, so that one day maybe we can have a president, Becerra, Hey, uh, and um, you know, I, I'm <laughs> you get an extra minute now. <laughs> uh, uh, and you know, I'm I'm very you know more than happy to speak to anyone who's interested in becoming a tech entrepreneur because I've been there uh, from the ground uh, and have built the company. We're now going to our next level of financing, which will take us to about thirty to forty-five people. So you know, that's that's where we are today. Thank you very much, Felix, for those comments. So I, I will ask just a couple of questions, and I know we have some, I believe they're roaming mics. Uh, if the, do we have the folks who have the microphones with us? And I want to make sure that, okay, there's one microphone here. So please, what we should probably do is see if you can raise your, start raising your hand. There's another mic more toward the back. Uh, so that way we can identify you quickly. I'm going to just ask a, a couple of quick questions. Um, CHC, I wanted me to ask what you can do to try to help bring the fastest growing population in America up to speed with what's going on with technology and what's going on within your company and industry. But clearly, you're here because you're doing it and you've explained how you're doing it. So let me ask you to be more, zero in a little bit more on the issue of what more can you do or what more should others be doing that you're doing and showing success at it? And uh, please, whoever wishes to respond. Yolanda? So, start. so I think, you know, one of the things that we need to do more of is sort of investing in the pipeline, right? So, you know, Ben was talking a little bit about, um, uh, you know, introducing sort of, um, minorities and sort of Latinos and, and blacks to sort of computer science. And it's one of the things that Google has been doing a lot of. But there, the, the fact of the matter is there aren't enough Latinos and blacks studying computer science, right, and, and being exposed to technology. And so we really have to address this issue of access. And so... Um, you know, Google has a, a number of sort of programs, internships. We partner with sort of Code 2040 to introduce um, and, and, and provide access um, and exposure <laughs> to computer science and to te technology. And, but we need to be doing more of that. Great. Anyone else? Yeah. I, I, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I completely agree that it's about access. And I also believe that it's about empowerment and it's about scaling, right? So access to technology, everyone and anyone should have access to technology. And I really do think that bringing it back to Uber and what we're doing, I really think that, that we're doing that. Anyone can, can download the app and be a writer. And then even though there are some 
prerequisites and requisites to become a driver, it, it's really op entrepreneurship at your fingertips. And then about empowerment, I think it's really important to not just give that access, but to really empower those individuals who have that access to use that technology and make the best of it. And then finally, I think it's really important to not just give the access and give the opportunity to, to become empowered by that, by that technology, but to really learn how to scale it, right? So once you've done something with this technology, share it. Um, teach people how to use it. Create that, that scalable effect. Um, and I think that that's really, really important. And, and that's something that we've seen at Uber, uh, I was mentioning earlier, that you know, riders, drivers like the one who I onboarded in, in Mexico City two summers ago are really taking a hold of this opportunity and running with it because they've come onto the platform, they've saved enough money to buy vehicles, and then they're managing a fleet and offering that opportunity to other members of their community. So completely agree with you. I saw Ed and I think Ben. Okay, and Felix, all, everyone will <laughs> the, the only thing that, that I would add is that um, one thing that I, I do personally is there's two magazines that I read uh, on a monthly basis. is Fast Company and, and Inc. Magazine uh, or Inc.com. And I think if there's anything that I could do more is, is how to promote a lot of these Latinos that are doing some great things at the early stages. Because these folks are no different from you and I. Um, they may have similar backgrounds. They may have similar upbringings. And a lot of it's just that they, they are getting the coaching, the mentoring, the access, the resources. But if we see that they, we could showcase these faces, we could showcase their story, I think it's going to inspire and motivate many of you guys to try something different so we could do what Felix is doing. We could do many of the things that, that Ben just mentioned of what's been happening with, with, with the organizations that they support. So if we could do more of that and celebrate that, but support them. Support them from the very beginning, support their, their, their services, support their products. I, I think it will go a long way. Ben? You know, just three quick things. Look, you know, as, as families, we really need to be pushing our kids into computer science. Uh, in California each year, about 47 black kids take the AP CS exam, the AP computer science exam. The number of Latino kids is about the same, and the Latino population is much larger. As activists, we absolutely have to push the, the largest companies. I mean, the work that's been done over the last few years has been very important. Um, you know, the biggest companies in the Valley were, were saying that they would not release their EEO1 data because their diversity stats were a trade secret. Like, can we just laugh about that for a second? <laughs> the, uh, and the work that activists did to empower people inside the company who wanted to do the right thing to get to the place where there was consensus to go ahead and do the right thing is critically important. But the role of, entrepreneur, the, the role of entrepreneurs here is ultimately the most important. The Valley has what people call a bro culture, right? You basically kind of hire who you know. You hire who was in your dorm room, right? And you work out from there. And so it's not surprising that when you take that network and those network of networks and you kind of map them out, you end up with one or 2% of the computer scientists being brown and one or 2% being black, right? Because who was in the dorm room? And that's why what Felix is doing and what our friends at Manos are doing is so important because the valley's built from the seeds like it always has been. And the seeds of the valley today are the startups. And ensuring that we are actually lifting up people like Felix as heroes to inspire young people to reach, to take the risk to be entrepreneurs is the only way that we will ultimately change the harvest of the valley. We have to start by changing the seeds. Felix, your turn. Yeah, I just want to add, I, I never took a single uh, computer science class. Uh, you know, I, I taught myself you know, how to There's cope. hope. There's hope, guys. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I have, like, uh, you know, I can't stay still in front of a computer, so I get very you know, anxious. But, you know, I, I think, you know, from a podium perspective, I think we should, like, congratulate Esther because it's having these type of discussions yeah. that empower and enable the younger generation that there could be people like, you know, Ben or Yolanda or individuals, you know, that are on the stage that you can strive to even be greater than us. Uh, you know, maybe we can inspire you to be the next billionaire or multimillionaire or, you know, run a foundation or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, that, that level of inspiration is what is needed to cultivate an ecosystem. Uh, because if we don't have that, if we can't see someone that resembles us or has gone through a story, uh, you know, like us or similar, then we can't, uh, you know, strive to or, or feel like we can be there. Uh, you know, we've raised, you know, when I was going through my fundraising uh, strategy or, you know, the process, 
Yeah, I, I didn't know half the terminology that these uh, MBAs were talking about. Uh, and I just read up on it. I, I read up a book. I got mentors. I was very lucky to have mentors. And that mentor aspect, that's why what Ed is doing with Manos is important. Uh, you know, it was a combination of mentoring, uh, you know, naiveness, uh, and wanting to just do something that can empower the world. That, that combination is what allowed me to create Veritas. And it can allow each and every one of you to do whatever you all want to achieve. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the, what I believe. You know, yeah, could be, yeah. Thank you, Felix. Let me ask a question that uh, is relevant for those of us in Washington, D.C. And to some degree, I think Yolanda and Andrea are probably best suited to give a, a response. But gentlemen, please as well uh, chime in. We are constantly in Congress asked to uh, authorize a statute that allows us to import people from across the world to come work in the United States, take high-tech jobs that pay upwards of $60,000, $80,000 because what we're told is by the high-tech community that there aren't enough skilled Americans to take these positions. And if we don't allow them to bring folks in from other countries, that many operations will have to leave the U.S. and go abroad where some of that talent is. Uh, I, I think we see that as in Congress, we've responded by saying, okay, we're gonna extend this. And we're talking in the hundreds of thousands of individuals who come in on a, an annual basis. And each and every one of those visas that's made available is scooped up within hours of the uh, beginning of the process to apply. That's a short-term solution. Uh, that'll never cure the ill of not, having, not graduating enough folks in computer science and the rest. So what should you all be doing you who are in the high-tech industry, um, and certainly this applies more to the larger companies than it does to the, the startups, but to all of you, uh, and certainly to the bigger players, what can we do to make sure that we have a long-term plan so that we always provide you the talent you need, but that we don't have to shop 3,000 miles away, you can shop 30 miles from your, your shop or wherever you might be within the U.S.? Yeah, so I think there are a couple of things. I mean, I think there's definitely sort of a, a policy angle, right? So, um, you know, part of this is, is, is working with places like, you know, the Department of Education and, and sort of in, in individuals from local governments around getting um, CS classes in, in high schools, right? Even in California, which is, you know, the heart of Silicon Valley, there are a number of, there are the number of CS classes that are offered at the sort of middle school and high school levels, it's smaller than you would think. And so we need to change that piece. And again, it's, it goes back to this, this exposure and access. It's really a long-term play. I was talking to some, um, some colleagues about this um, earlier this morning. Um, but we need to change sort of the, edu the education pieces so, and get this embedded um, within, within high schools. Um, and get exposure there. I think, uh, so we need to be lobbying <laughs> various folks ar around that. I, uh, I think it's um, helping to fund some of the, there's some great nonprofits that are out there that for whom this is their sweet spot, right? And so it's, it's like, like code 2040. And um, I think we need to make, the, the, valley, the companies in the Valley need to make sure that we're funding these folks and making sure that they have um, sort of the pockets to really extend their reach and help them scale and, and at scale in the right way. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I think it's also two more things. I think it's about communicating these opportunities. We need to be better about spreading the word and telling people about these entrepreneurial opportunities that are available, right? Um, and I also think it's about for those who cannot necessarily, um, who may not have access to those tools, it's providing those tools. So l let me give you an example of how Uber is doing this. So we have, we have a, more than, than a few people who want to drive for Uber but don't have a car. Right? So what happens if you don't have the sufficient credit or if you have gaps in your credit history and you, and you cannot buy a, buy a car or finance a car? What Uber has done is we realized this, this is a big problem. And in order to make sure that we have the kind of supply that, that, that we want to have to be able to provide a good service um, on, our, on our platform, we came up with this uh, concept of a vehicle financing program where we have partnerships with car manufacturers like GM, Toyota, and Ford, and banks like Santander, and we do the financing for, um, for those who, who are in need of it, and we basically guarantee that you can get uh, lower than market prices and, and rates. So it's, it's about the tools and it's about the communication. Is there one other thing? Okay, then we'll go to the gym. I'm sorry, just, just really quickly. The other thing is um, there aren't enough role models, right? I, I, Felix, I was sort of floored when you talked about sort of the diversity in your team, but there needs to be sort of more role models around this. And so we, working with media companies and um, getting storylines where people are seeing themselves 
and we and we have it. So I'll leave it at that. Let the gentleman. So, so and, I, and I, by the way, gentlemen. Uh, so I'll let everyone who wants to respond. But as we get close to running out of time, when we get a question from the audience, we won't have time for everyone to ask. So I will try to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to respond to questions. But go right ahead. So on my previous life, I, uh, I was one of those corporate guys that actually. Uh, did the immigration and got visas for, for many other ethnic groups. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you where, where I think when you look at these uh, cases, what we look for is really um, experience through internships, not just a GPA. So I would recommend that any Latino, here's, here's a secret sauce, that do get accepted the first week, go to your career center learn how to network, learn how to um, put together a resume, look at these uh, social network t t tools, look how to ask for help. Don't wait until your junior year, don't wait until your senior year, because the competition is fierce out there, you're already laying the game. So f start freshman year, get connected, and start thinking what three or four years will look like, and we won't have this issue, in, in my view. Yeah, so just kind of three quick numbers to put out that are going to put this in perspective. So they say that there's going to be a shortage of up to one million programmers, computer scientists in the Valley in 10 years. They also say that the combined GDPs of India, the place where we get a lot of our talent, as well as China and Brazil could swamp those of the G8 within the next 15 years. We right now have one of the largest sort of transformational intensive STEM training programs in the country. It has 300 kids in it each year. We estimate that there's about 100,000 other black and brown kids in the country who have the skills, the interest, the motivation to go through a program like that. We have to recognize, I was sitting with Lou Gossett, been a fan of for a long time, and he spent his entire life fighting for racial justice, and he said, you know, Ben, I, I worry I worry that we've stopped looking outside the window of the plane, that we're all still here fighting over who's in first class, and the plane has lost 25,000 feet. If we could just focus on a second about who needs to be in the pilot seat, because they're either drunk or asleep or dead, we might start gaining altitude again. Now, why do I say this? I say this because we need to stop acting like it's just a, brown and just a black and brown problem, that our community's young people aren't being trained and educated. Right? When we say to our 300 people in the SMASH program, what do you need in your schools that you don't have? They say laboratories and computer science education. Fairly fundamental. It's not just our problem, it's a national problem. If we think that India will continue to give us its best and brightest, even as its economy dwarfs ours, we're kidding ourselves. This issue is an issue, frankly, of ultimately of national security. If we want to lead this world in the 21st century the way that we did in the 20th, we have to understand that in order to lead an increasingly flat world, you have to be an increasingly flat country. And including the black and brown communities isn't a nice thing to do. It's fundamental to your success. Felix, did you wish to? Oh, we can get to the question. Okay. Thank you. I see we have our first question. Can you give us your name? Hi, my name is Raul Gonzalez. I'm from California. I'm with the California Teacher Association. I'm also a kindergarten teacher. And I'm being faced with this very problem that you were speaking of right now, uh, gentlemen here in the middle speaking of uh, Mr. Uh, and Raul, as Gallus. close to your mouth as possible that microphone. One of the things that we're seeing now is that we're having a shift with the Common Core and the new Smarter Balance testing. We're, we're shifting to technology, a technology-based assessment. So one of the things that we're finding even within our own uh, colleagues is that we really need some outreach or, and some investment from the Googles and some of the bigger companies that have that potential. It's, it's really a, a, an outreach that, that's going to help us with the infrastructure of the assessment. It's also going to help with the investment because, of course, as we've all shared here, there's a vested interest in getting these students up to speed. The, the, the ground has, has been laid. I mean, the, the field has been prepped for you guys to really seed it and take advantage of it. Yeah. Is there so a I question? guess the question is, what kind of outreach and what kind of investment are, are big companies like a Google willing to do uh, into the communities to help out? So, so we, we actually have, um, as part of uh, my larger organization, my, one of my colleagues actually runs sort of our K-12 um, program. 
And um, actually, there are a number of other sort of teams within Google that are focused on sort of K-12 education. We've historically focused more our sweet spot on sort of the high school, sort of middle school um, area and haven't quite gone down to, to elementary. Um, but I, I would say we're willing to make you know, some really big investments because we recognize, as, as Ben pointed out, I mean, this is like, it, it isn't like a black and brown problem. It's, it's, it is the US's problem. Mm -hmm. And um, are talking with um, various sort of teacher associations around the best way to do that. You know, what part of the challenge is that it's, it's hard to scale. And this is actually a great, this is actually, the, the whole education space is, is a great um, issue for a lot of the big tech companies to rally around, right, and do something about. And so, you know, we are, we're committed to doing something in this area for sure. I see we have another question in the back. Yes, go right ahead. Give us your name. Hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm from Fresno, California. Um, my question comes as a community member and a sister and a friend from people out there um, that want to get involved in technology but don't, haven't been able to go to school to get a STEM degree, um, that want to do hands-on a little bit more, that have gone to like, you know, ITT Tech, those kinds of schools that um, still want to tap into high tech and succeed in, in um, technology. So I was wondering what suggestions you have for those people um, or if it's absolutely necessary to get a college degree in computer science to do that. Who wants to tackle that one? Yeah, uh, I don't have a computer science degree. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I, I actually view the community colleges as the nervous system of our economy, uh, where community colleges can become the incubators that can enable the empowerment of individuals that may otherwise think they don't have access to capital. And, and, and so, like, uh, long, in Cal uh, by the way, New York is also another tech hub, and so is Boston, so the Valley's not the only place where you can build a company, Arizona too. Uh, but you know, the, the work that you know, uh, Ed is doing with Manos uh, or accelerators like that, ha gaining access or insight to those type of events. You know, there's other venues like that you can attend such as South by Southwest or uh, reading technology blogs like TechCrunch or uh, Hacker News. Um, it depends the type of technology that you want to get engaged with, right? If it's education, you can read like Ed Surge or GSV EDU. Uh, it just varies on the level of technology you want to you know, engage with. But just because you don't have a STEM degree doesn't mean you can't get engaged into creating a startup and building a company that can be very successful and, and powerful. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and I think that I'd like to add that networking is also really important. I mean, I, I majored with, with uh, a BA in human biology, so I also was not a, a CS major, but I was so interested in the world of technology. And granted, I, I live in San Francisco, but I was so interested in the, in the world of technology that I informed myself, so read TechCrunch every day. Um, and, and I networked, right? And I asked about these opportunities, and, and I, when I found one that I, that I liked, which was the, the job that I currently have at Uber, at Uber I went. And, and sought it out. So I think you definitely need to network and, and be well informed as well as being aggressive about what you want. Let's go to our next question. Please give us your name. Hi, Sonia Martin Solis. I'm from Los Angeles and also with the California Teachers Association. Um, my question is kind of twofold. One, in education, in our classrooms, the infrastructure of the actual classroom sometimes deters um, we have had many companies donate computers or iPads, tablets, whatnot, but we don't have the capacity within the classroom to support that. So that's one. How can we fix that? And number two is, even in our communities, especially when you're talking about low-income communities, the parents don't really have access to internet services because the cities don't provide them necessarily. The school does it within the school as far as wireless access. What can we do in order to provide many of our minority communities with this access that would then give them the opportunities to explore and experiment if they have some of these devices that, they, that the schools or the different programs, different community organizations would provide? Who wishes to, to respond? It's <laughs> a good question. It's a it's so I think um, to, to answer your so your first point around um, there often isn't sort of like the training among sort of the teacher or the capacity among the tra teachers um, d when, once we get sort of the technology in there. I think part of part of the solution there is actually is building that capacity, right? So training teachers and I know um, it's one of the things that we're you know it's very early on that we're sort of exploring is what you know what role Google can play. In building that capacity on the teacher side, because I, I mentioned that we need to have computer science in, in the schools, 
who's going to teach it though, right? So, so we recognize that we, we, we actually have to think very holistically about the solutions here and how do we build that capacity and how do we train teachers appropriately. Um, around sort of the access for your parents are, one of the things that Google has recognized, we've done a lot of research on this, is that um, the encouragement of parents is critical in folks studying computer science, right? And um, so we're tackling that in a couple different ways. I don't think we have a perfect, uh, a perfect answer. Um, we actually piloted a program in South Carolina it's relatively rural South Carolina, um, called CS First, which is an after school, basically we created a 12 week, 10 to 12 week CS curriculum and provided sort of, uh, provided sort of the, the hardware um, that was for uh, basically, th th these were in mostly minority communities um, that taught them sort of computer science. We actually also had a, a parent encouragement piece that actually involved the parents. Um, we're expanding that pilot to New York in 2015 and hopefully if it works there we'll expand it, but th it's, it, it, we're, we're experimenting, experimenting in different ways to, to um, sort of educate those parents and bring them along as well, but it's a hard problem. It's a really hard problem to solve, and I, I think it's an excellent question that you raise. Go ahead, Ed. and then we'll go to our next question. Uh, I, I struggle to answer this because of, from a reflection standpoint, um, <coughs> I, I see the direction in which what's happening in classrooms where, where the, the, this is where the technology is going, right? And students or families that are not prepared or equipped for that are, will get left behind. And, and I actually have volunteered, and a lot of it has to be because um, my mom, who is a retired librarian for the city of San Jose, um, I do a lot of volunteer work every Saturday in the uh, computer science lab yeah. where parents come and we're teaching them how to use these educational applications. And what started um, with three or four, now there's like 20, 25 parents coming in, and, it, I, I, it's, and it's going to other branches. So I know the need is there, but we do have to teach parents that this is the new way of, of learning, and they have to get involved. And so I still struggle with that, even though um, I'm making the time, we just need more resources, more help to educate the parents, because um, if they're not there equipped, supporting the, their kids, it's gonna happen so fast that they're, they're, they're just not gonna have the right skills that's gonna help us in the future. We have, if everyone is brief and to the point, we may have time for two quick questions. Give us your name, please. Kevin Blackburn from Oakland, California. The emphasis on uh, corporate philanthropy and giving into the tech sector is it's easy to put it on the tech sector, but every sector of business is touched by technology. And I guess my question is, how can we leverage pressure on corporate America as a whole to invest in educating uh, the next generation of, of programmers and computer scientists and not just solely let it rest on Silicon Valley? Good question. We'd like to uh, give it a shot. Ben. You know, I mean, look, if one of those points of uh, le leverage is this visa process for tech workers, right? Um, if companies are going to be asking for short-term fix, they need to be investing in a long-term solution. Uh, yeah. Because when you keep letting somebody like deal with their short-term fix, that's called an addiction. It doesn't end well for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's good. We have time for one more. I think we do have time for one more, maybe even two. Yes, whoever's got the microphone. Hi, Please. my name is Camila Proctor. All right, Proctor. here we go. Go right ahead. Thank Give you us so your much name. for this panel. Camila Proctor. Camille, thank you. Thank you. I just had a quick question about diversity. Um, how many individuals are part of your community, part of your staff, are living with a disability, and what is your outreach to the disability community within communities of color, especially with tech? Great question. So, I'm sorry, so how many people have disabilities on our staff? Like in, in the company or on my, our individual teams? Well, you're look, I'm looking at the out, I'm sorry, I'm looking with regards to you speaking about your out, reaching out to the communities of color, within the communities of color, people with disabilities. How, what is your outreach model for that? And is there anybody on your staff? Eh, I guess we call it the, the K suite or the C suite that are, that are living with a disability. So part of the challenge of, of disability in general is that not all, not all disabilities are visible, right? And you're also, you're also relying on the person to disclose their disability. So, um, uh, so I, you know, I don't think, we actually don't have an accurate count of how many people with disabilities are, are at Google. 
Um, that said, we actually do actively do outreach um, to, the, to, to the PWD community um, globally. Um, we work with, you know, with uh, consultants, specialized consultants to help us build our pipeline. Um, I, I would say that we haven't cut it where it's specifically disability, people with disabilities of color. It's sort of the broader disability community. Um, but we actually use these consultants to help um, build our pipeline for our internship program. So we have a diversity-focused internship called, program called BOLD um, on the non-tech side, and we have one called Engineering Practicum on the, tech, on the technical side. But we use those, con those consultants to help identify PWDs that we might hire into our internship program. So um, we are doing sort of outreach, hiring outreach on that side Great. at Google. Yeah. Anyone else, or can we go to one last question? Let's go to one last question. Hey, good Thanks afternoon, Chris Turner with Dell. Uh, question specifically for uh, Ben and Felix. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about entrepreneurship and its relationship to STEM. Uh, I am of the belief, and my company is of the belief, my founder is of the belief that entrepreneurs are made, not born, and that starts at K-12, not in college. So I'm wondering, Felix, if you could talk a little bit about your experiences, what gave you the entrepreneurial gene? And Ben, if you could talk a little bit about what your organization is doing at the K through 12 level to encourage not just computer science, uh, but entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, I used to watch Bobby from Bobby's World uh, <laughs> and the Jetsons. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it was just my imagination. Like, uh, I have a big imagination. You know, I, I dream of like living in space one day. Uh, or under, underwater. Uh, hopefully Richard Branson can make that happen. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, that, that's, that's just the power of imagination. And I think oftentimes where we are today as a society, we're limiting that imagination of the younger generation, uh, especially in school by pushing them into like certain things that they may not want to do. Uh, you know, for example, my dad wanted me to become a lawyer. Uh, at 22, we working in a big white sh uh, you know, shoe firm in like New York City uh, doing corporate banking uh, litigation. And you know, at 17, I decided to just go into the army just to get away from all that. Um, so is that uh, alignment of like imagination and the discipline factor from the military that enabled me to become you know an entrepreneur that I am today? But you know, without that imagination, I wouldn't be here today. The um, I think you're absolutely right that you have to actually invest in actually making entrepreneurs. You can't just assume they're going to pop up like Horatio, like uh, Horatio Alger somewhere. You know, we uh, have our SMASH program, hundreds of kids every summer. They're being trained in, you know, in depth in STEM, the full range of STEM. Within that is also teaching them how to run a small business and entrepreneurship. We also have our SMASH prep program because we noticed that specifically in California, we had a paucity of black boys in the program. And that's down at the junior high school level on the, on the weekends. Uh, we also run hackathons around the country where we get young people, we, we kind of introduce them to, to coding on their tablets. We actually often give them tablets to, to do that. But part of that is getting them to actually think about how to solve a problem in their community. For some of those young people, those are, those are absolutely market-based uh, solutions. We're also, I think, just to be you know, a um, majority-minority investment team. Our investment team is 40% black, it's 20% Latino, it's 40% white. And we spend a lot of time, quite frankly, with um, young entrepreneurs, typically parents, pushing them to think bigger. Because in our communities, in black and Latino communities, we're so used to dealing with, with in an in a, in a environment of not having enough credit that we often pace our dreams in ways that are just incongruous with, with the situation in the valley where there's a lot of credit if you have a great idea. There's a lot of investment capital if you have a great idea, rather. And so uh, I hope that in doing that, in really lifting up this next generation of entrepreneurs, that they will be raising young people who dream differently. The way that if you were raised by somebody who, for instance, maybe had three or four dry cleaners, but never had the relationship with the bank that, that they should have because they were discriminated against, you sort of dream about business one way. But if you're growing up in Felix's household, you'll dream about business in an entirely different way. So as we get ready to conclude, can I ask one quick question? Um, you see people of color talking about this industry, which is so important to us. Um, how often do the folks of color who are in this industry actually get together and talk like this about doing something uh, other than when you're invited by a panel here in Washington, D.C.? It's usually at a bar late 
<laughs> and we try not to broadcast or tweet about it. <laughs> uh, you know, at least in the young tech community that I'm part of, you know, there's not many Latinos or African Americans. You know, I can count them on one hand uh, that, that I know. I mean, and uh, unfortunately, uh, that's just the world that we, environment that we live in. Because access to capital is very hard, no matter, uh, because if you think about it, if you come from an underserved community and you're not part of the algorithm, which is not talked about, which is whether it's Stanford, Harvard, Yale, whatever it may be, the level of access is very difficult. So you can't build that network. Uh, so yeah, I, that's why I think what Esther is doing here today can potentially become that, because we don't have a national voice, right? We, we have no entrepreneurship within the, uh, the Latino tech community has no national voice. And so if we can evolve that, whether it's through CHCI or whatever it may be, you know, that, that could be a big deal and a starting point. Anyone else before we close? I, I do believe it's, it's fragmented. I think there is groups that are doing little bits and pockets. Um, just a little short period of time that we've been in existence where we've actually had a couple of kickoff events and demo events where we are attracting about 200 community members, other Latinos from other Google, Yahoo, LinkedIn, and I see relationship being built. They're like, wow, you know, I, I work in this company. I didn't realize there were so many Latinos in this, in, 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 in this company. So we're shaking the tree. They're falling out, and we just got to be more organized because there's other groups out there that have been doing it for a long time in this space both in the entrepreneurship standpoint, but also on the investment standpoint. But if we could see how we can work together and begin to network and not necessarily feel that we're competing against one another, it's gonna be a stronger ecosystem as Felix mentioned earlier. Anyone else, sir? Well, can we give them a round of applause for their presentation? To Yolanda Mangolini, to Ed Avila, to Ben Jealous, to Andrea Pimentel, and to Felix Ortiz, thank you so much. Congratulations on your success. Bring us with you. Thank you all. We're done for this afternoon.